Hey guys, I'm Janet on occasion, and uh, I'm in the warp at the moment. It's just how I roll. I got my cup of tea. Got my cup of tea. Uh, also, uh, this cup you may recognise is one of the cups from Television's Taskmaster. Yeah. They also shop at the co-op. So anyway, um, yeah, we're we're gonna go over a Q and A today, uh, or an AMA. It's an there's cues being aid, so whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, Creative Assembly did a AMA on their official Discord, the official Total War Discord. And uh, well, I want to go over all the answers because there's some really cool questions being asked by the community and there were some good answers and I want to go over them and we might learn something. Um, I think it might be fun. There's a hell of a lot. This will be really chill. So, you know, I've got my cup of tea. You should get yours uh, before you carry on uh, with this video. I don't mind, you know, you can pause me all you want um that's fine it won't hurt my feelings um but don't leave that will hurt my feelings love you so anyway uh first off all right let's get stuck in shall we let's get stuck in so first see a duck coming in strong with an answer so uh well actually it's just to just to explain what's going on so hi all we'll work at my way through the questions uh through the questions i can answer but here's the first one grandfather nurgle comes in with the question in these skulls for the skull throne stream there were two pictures with some unit cards and some marked minotaurs uh in there right beside scarbrand aka the hero is that a slaughter priest uh by chance uh, I'm assuming is what they're trying to say. No, it is not a slaughter priest. The roster reveal will reveal what he is. So, roster reveal can you know confirmed there. Yay! Nice, quick, immediate benefit from this AMA. So we're off to a good start. Right then, uh, Rise of Lamb says, "Do we have any news in the collect uh, on the collector's edition yet?" Uh, Gray says, "No, it'll be announced when it's announced." Okay, but that's her line every time she's been uh, like asked. And it's constantly, happens all the time. But, you know, you, you got to, right? Uh, I actually want to get my hands on that as well, honestly. So anyway, next one. Uh, Azux um, says, Are the new Chaos factions able to recruit legendary lords from the Chaos Warriors DLC? No, not for the Warhammer 3 release, at least. So uh, that means there is going to be sort of separate rosters, um, you know, from the previous content, which I think is a good thing, honestly, and I think that leaves more room to blend it all together later, um, as they introduce more sort of specific uh, characters here and there, because currently, what seems to be the case is they're going all in with demons, right? That's what it is, it's going to be the, the Chaos Divided, but it's going to be a demon at the head of each of them, because it's the demon game, right? You know, conquer your demons is the tagline. So I think the idea of keeping, uh, keeping them separate for those initial um, sort of factions makes a lot more sense rather than just throwing in a bunch of the generic chaos stuff because like who wants the generic stuff well, it's boring now go all in full full flavor and then later on we can have more sort of hybrid factions um when it's when it's the more sort of um chaos warriors um specific units i think that makes more sense but anyway so i like the sound of that i'm honestly glad i'm honestly glad weird to be glad at less variety but i think that's a good direction to go in um to just make it feel different i don't want to just have stuff from previous games i want them to have fully fleshed out rosters that aren't relying on old stuff because old stuff's old i don't care about it let's get new stuff and that's what's happening so that's great um so next up we have um uh, doc Payne at 222 says when can we expect to see the kiss Levin corn roster reveals and can we expect to hear anything at e3 this weekend soon the roster reveals and no nothing at e3 which honestly i'm fine with i'm totally fine with uh, um, i've heard disappointment already at that but i i'm glad <laughs> like i want to i want to hear about new stuff at e3 i don't want to hear about stuff that i'm already following like we're getting a bunch of news out regardless of e3 already like why does it need to be at e3 it's sort of unnecessary um yeah i don't know anyway um will human corn infantry have their own animations or use warriors of chaos resources in that regard they are reusing existing warriors of chaos animation tables i mean they don't need new animations they're swinging an axe just use the swing and axe animation that's fine by me um so uh buys asked how much of a leap graphically is the game compared to game 2 is it closer to 3k and troy like i know it's the same engine but is it an upgraded version similar to 3k uh have there been any improvements to the textures of game 1 and 2 units specifically game 1 they looked a bit outdated in the game yeah yeah if you if you really you know uh, uh had a you know a looking glass at them yeah but mostly it was fine i think um but 
another upgrade. They are going to be lagging behind a bit. So we have uh, significantly updated the engine to inherit some of the graphical features found in 3K. We will be investigating how much work can be done with the Warhammer 1 and 2 textures, but some of the additional engine and shader work should help bring them up to the quality found in Warhammer 3. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, you can have very simple looking games that look brilliant just because of the lighting. You don't need texture detail necessarily to make a game look great. Look at Minecraft with RTX. I mean, flipping out, that game looks incredible just because the lighting's really good. So, you know, you're just sort of, uh, your brain is tricked because the lighting is accurate. You're tricked into thinking, oh, that's reality. Um, you know, we're just walking in a weird plastic world where it's just perfect cubes everywhere. You just sort of believe it because the lighting's good. So um, it makes a lot of sense. If the shaders are good, then it should all look good. Um, right. Heldon says, is the entire Kislev roster at a GW, Games Workshop, uh, so it's like a Games Workshop creation, I guess, that they have passed on to you, saying this is what we are creating for Kislev, or are you allowed artistic freedom to create, for example, more variants or certain units? And uh, uh, Baj here answers, we have worked very closely with Games Workshop on the Kislev designs to ensure that they not uh, that not only do we respect the law that they have established for the race, but also that they fit in with the visual aesthetic we have established for all three games. Whilst we have some creative freedom, everything is reviewed and approved by Games Workshop and their expert design teams. Fair enough. So uh, I think back and forth makes the most sense. So it'll fit with this game, it'll fit with theirs. Like, you know, it's, it's good to have that back and forth, I think. Um, because there are a bunch of designers on both sides that are really talented. So getting more input, that's great. I think that's fantastic. So um, Rage of Fire asks, will there be a rework of any current monsters from the Warriors of Chaos roster, e.g. gore beasts, warhounds, giants, and trolls? Dirk says, no, at least not for the Warhammer 3 release. Uh, re I don't know what they mean by rework though. Like they're just units, they're fine. Like, what, what do they need? <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, like, their stats, I guess? Tweaked? But I think that's balancing. That's different. That's not really a rework. Unless it means, you know, will Gore Beast have a corn hat on? Or a Nurgle beak? You know, whatever. Um, so anyway. Uh, Alexcon um, says, In two trailers, we've seen Bear Cavalry on Brown Bears. What's the difference? Uh, we've seen Bear Cavalry on Brown Bears. What's the difference? Of those and the polar bear riding cavalry, are they normally are they a normally recruitable variant? Will there be more Kislevite units using brown bears instead of polar bears? Would be neat. Cheers. Uh, so Duck answers. So at one point during development, the Kislev war bear riders were riding brown bears. They are now riding white bears instead. But some of the cinematics were done before that change occurred. So okay, so all polar bears, perhaps. Although that's only the bear riders. So maybe it's. A case of there's some confusion about the bear riders if there's you know some on polar bears you know some units look like on polar bears some look like brown bears but i think the um i think there are still brown bears pulling the sleds right am i remembering that correctly so i think there's still some distinction still but honestly if they're all polar bears that's fine you know whatever um it's just a visual difference isn't it doesn't really make much difference uh functionally but still that's fine um so interesting to know that cinematics being done you know while there's still changes like that going on. So, next up, um, Gremvi asks, I noticed that in the trailer, Scarbrand is shown briefly flying for a moment. One of the things that makes Scarbrand unique from other Bloodthirst is that he has lost the ability to fly after being exiled by Korn. Would he be able to fly in the game? And if he can, is there an explanation for this? And C.A. James answers, Scarbrand can't fly in the game. His wings are ruined. He does have a, a jump wing flap animation, but he won't be flying around in game. Uh, yeah, loads of people went mad about that go he can't fly this is rubbish they don't know what they're talking about of course they know what they're doing like jesus like they, they it's like the one thing like there's like four paragraphs about scarbrand in the eighth edition army book and one of them says he can't fly like this isn't <laughs> like it just looks cool when he jumps up in the air in a trailer like that's fine you know but people went mad but uh, no of course he can't of course he can't fly scarbrand can't fly it's that simple. And yeah, him jumping in the air. Like, a chicken can jump and flap. They're not flying. It's a bloody chicken. Scarbrand's just a big chicken. Relax. So um, anyway, there's your confirmation. So anyway, uh, Baj. Uh, answering questions by uh, Tyranid Mista and Featherus here. Why is Slambo the best character? <laughs> you and I are kindred spirits. Apparently Baj also likes Slambo. Uh, Featherus says, uh, what is your favourite Kislev and corn unit and why? Uh, Bar says the Skull Cannon, because it's a flaming cannon on a motorbike. Fair enough. <laughs> That's hard to argue with. Um, Grace asking, uh, answering question from Phil57, do you guys still work from home? Yep. 
They are currently still working from home. Honestly, amazing the amount of stuff they're getting out. Like, I'm sure they've got like a good rhythm for this stuff now, but God, like, you know, obviously as a YouTuber, I work from home. It's rubbish. <laughs> it would be great to be in a studio, you know, separate church and state a bit, but no, like I'm, I live and work in the same space. It's not healthy. It's, uh, it's really difficult. So massive respect for them being able to continue churning out you know great content and stuff it's it's really impressive so good on them uh so helios what is the name of the kitty cat of the kislev roster the kislev kitty cat uh it's a snow leopard unless you mean the human name like jason but it's not jason <laughs> so yeah specifically the specific name don't know but it's a snow leopard uh do you actually enjoy warhammer fantasy yes what a strange question do you actually enjoy it like are you pretending why would you... I don't know. It seems strange. I mean, I guess it's a job to be there, but, like, still, how soul-crushing would it be to stick with a company that long? Like, you know, there are other options. Um, but anyway, Duck. So, uh, Duck is answering a question from the chair. What battle mechanics does Ka the uh, does Kord's army have? Would it be similar to the Dark Elves? Tomb Kings, Greenskins, or would it be similar to attributes like Scurry Away and Berserk slash Rage? Korn's battle mechanic revolves around killing the enemy. Each kill made by the Korn army adds to... Uh, his battle resource, which can be spent to fire uh, off one of three army abilities. Additionally, several corn units come with passive abilities that scale in intensity based on the number of kills made by that unit. So most of it revolves around killing. So I do like the idea of that. That's sort of like a, a, a bit like Murderous Prowess, but specific to a unit, which I think is quite good. It's something split between Murderous Prowess and um, just like... Uh, uh, what is it? Uh... uh is it Berserk? The one that the Norskins have that's tiered, you know? So something in between that. It goes by kills rather than just timing combat. Which is cool. I like that. So they're sort of rewarded for success, not just rewarded for turning up, which uh, I think is sort of interesting and sort of a slightly different dynamic. Um, it sort of encourages them to prey on the weak, which is uh, actually sort of anti-corn when you think about it, because they should be proving themselves against the strongest things. So, ah, huh, maybe I've just found a slight problem with that design choice, but you know, it's fine, sounds fun. So, um, right, another one about the Snow Leopard. Is the Snow Leopard unit a single entity or a group of them? It's a single entity. Um, the Jeff says, uh, is every unit for the Corner Kiss Lever Austin now revealed via the trailers slash gameplay videos or do you still have surprises left to reveal? Barge says winky face. He doesn't say winky face, he does a winky face, or at least he prints the emoji winky face. Um, so surprises surprises incoming i'm sure so is the snow leopard a unit or a summon it's both so you can summon it or bring it which uh that sounds great actually i do like the sound of it so um thank you grace for that answer uh featherus says what is your favorite kiss left corn unit and why we have that already but someone else is answering it now ducks uh giving it a go streltsy are my favorite kiss left unit the epitome of what kiss left gameplay is all about and their animations some of my favorites i love the streltsy as well I could not stop talking about the Streltsy uh, in previous videos. I think they look so cool. I love it. Gun axe, guys. Gun axe. So good. Um, so, for Korn, I'm a massive fan of Scarbrand. He's such a killing machine. He does look like an absolute baller. And he's got to be a killing machine because he can't fly. Right? He's got to be really good. That and it's Scarbrand. He's supposed to be a killing machine. That's sort of his thing. Um, that's his only thing. He's not supposed to be sort of flexible or anything. He just literally kills. Just send him in. He just kills. Whatever's near him, kills. Just that's his thing. So, he should be. Uh, anyway, Thorgrim Grudgebearer. It's good this question was answered, or else Grace would probably end up in the book. So, we know you can't discuss any future content, but do you have any hard dates set for any upcoming reveals that you can share? No. <laughs> Keep an eye on this Discord and social media to see things first, though. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, new content, it seems unlikely to, to get it from a Q&A, right? If they have stuff to reveal, there's usually a lot of planning going into that, so they can do it. So, yeah, fair enough. Uh, right, uh, uh, ooh, where am I? Here we go. Uh, Joy Johns asks, Will Katarin have a mount option? If so, can you reveal which mounts she gets? Uh, Duck says, she will have mount options. Can't reveal the mounts yet. I'm assuming the sled. I'm assuming an ice sled will be one of them. Um, ooh, maybe an elemental bear. Ooh, do you think that'll be a thing? Oh, that could be sick. That could be really cool. Elemental bear mount. Uh, although, I don't know. I know, I'd hate for her to just sort of 
end up just having to tank like that. I prefer her being a bit more mobile. So I'd prefer if it's like the sled was the was the max one, I think. Unless she gets like a snow dragon or something. Oh my god, can you imagine a snow dragon? That'd be cool. Uh, anyway. So, uh, Eddie Boss says, uh, will the Horde rework apply to other Horde factions? Warriors of Chaos Nakai, maybe in some way Vampire Coast, or just the Beastmen? This, of course, is for the, the new DLC, not Warhammer 3. Uh, the Beastmen rework has been created bespoke to capture the Beastmen fantasy, so not a general Horde rework. Uh, honestly, I'm glad. I don't think Hordes need a general rework. Like, they're just... The things that they tend to be lacking is, is settlements, right? <laughs> Just they work differently. They should be able to move as they do. I don't think there's any huge uh, overhaul that can be done to them to make them just better. I think just some people don't enjoy that. They like painting the map. So, um, you know, I don't think there should be huge changes to the hordes in general, but they can certainly, you know, rework Beastmen to feel more like the Beastmen. So, you know, can't wait to see what that's like. So, right. Uh, um, says. Would Grace say that the Silence and the Fury is a good nickname for the Total War Reddit? <laughs> Grace says uh, she'd go with the Hunter and the Beast. Fair enough. Acid Rum says, can you share if Kiss, uh, if the Kiss Love cat we see in the trailer is a hero, a summon, or a generic unit? The Snow Leopard is a unit and a summon. Uh, Pobs asks, is everyone from CA huddled together, answering these questions together? And uh, <laughs> they're all in a call together, apparently. That seems the best way to do it. You know, oh, you're answering this one? Oh, I'm answering this one. You know, it's good. It's good. It's good to know that this process is being handled uh, uh, in a, in a uh, expeditious way. Because that way you get more answers. And I like that. Um, so, Blythe asks, is the effect, uh, is the ice effect on Kiss of Light War Sleds final? Or is it something that could be adjusted before release? And Bonner says, everything is still a work in progress. Because, of course, it is. So, assume, assume there's going to be changes here and there. But, um, yeah. Uh, I think it looks great. I don't, I don't see the problem with it. Um, anyway, let's have a look here. The throng is mustered. Great name, great name. What kind of abilities can we expect from Kosteltin? Uh He comes with the four Kislev Patriarch hymns. Uh, one each for Urson, Salyak, Daz, and Tor. Oh, good. I like that Tor's got a uh, got got a component there. Tor is the god of thunder. If that wasn't uh, that's not a typo, by the way, it's T O R. Uh, Tor, but yeah, he's the god of thunder. Which I think is a lot of fun. I like that there's a, some sort of Norse uh, references there. I like that. So, anyway, these are area of effect support abilities, offering a toolkit of both healing, vigor, restoration, leadership buffing, and melee attack buffs. Additionally, Castelton has a host of passive abilities that buff units around him when he is wounded, and other passives that make him exceedingly hard to kill. Very cool. He does sound good, just a general purpose like support hero. But as well, just having um, references to all those different gods. Uh, I think it's really good just for flavour, you know? I think that's really nice. Because uh, there's a huge amount of gods in Warhammer and very few of them actually get a mention. So the more they can introduce that, the more it sort of feels like a part of the Warhammer universe. So I like that. Um, so anyway, uh, Puddy Pounce says, will Corn be a Horde faction? No, Corn will not be a Horde faction. Uh, which I like. I like I like being able to create a domain, you know, to rule over. Uh, I think that's always fun. So... Uh, Victor Mashu says, after seeing the uh, teaser and considering the importance of the last two lizard lords that could enter the game being uh, Oxyotl in the end, what was the reason that made uh, CA choose Oxyotl over Teto Echo? So Sean says, uh, it's always hard to choose which character to turn into a legendary lord, but we, t uh, we look at lots of factors, but in this specific case we thought Oxyotl's background with chaos made him a great match for Beastmen. I think that makes a lot of sense too. So, yeah, cool. Nice to know, though. Uh, Spezmarine04 says, Does Korn only have one Legendary Lord or multiple like Kislev? Uh, just one, Scarbrand. Lawful Magician asks, With new units like the Bloodthirst being added, will there be additional options for enhanced control of flying units, i.e. manual toggle between flying and landed? Duck says they are looking into it but there are a fair share of problems to solve with it. So can't give a definitive yes or no answer. Um, I know this is unpopular opinion, but, you know, I'm not designing the game, so my opinion doesn't matter, um, frankly. I hope they don't. I hope they never do that. I, I honestly hope that for the sake of uh, predictability in gameplay, I think they should just behave how they do now, where if they're out of combat for a certain amount of time, they'll 
fly up into the air again. I think that's the most predictable thing, and I think with a strategy game, you need that level of predictability. Um, I think the idea of just sort of sitting down, I mean, there are times where it's advantageous, because, like, you know, if the other person's brought a much bigger air force than you, you might want to land, right? But that's sort of the fun of it. That's sort of the fun of the asymmetry, you know? You That's a puzzle that you have to overcome. If they just give you a toggle, then it's not a puzzle you have to overcome, so suddenly you lose a strategic layer. You know, you just choose, am I better in the air or on the ground? And you just pick it, and that's it. That's your default stance for the whole game. And like, yeah, I don't know. It would take the puzzle element out. It's a strategy game, it's supposed to be a puzzle. So I hope they never fix it. I hope they never do that. I don't even consider it a fix. I hope they never have a landing toggle. And yeah, I'm sure a lot of you will hate me for that, but I'm not designing the game, so who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. It's just an opinion. But anyway, um, I hope they never fix it. I think the game would be, would be weaker for it. So, uh, Tiki Haka Haka says, Can you pet the polar bears? <laughs> but says, Not if you value your fingers. Fair. Fair enough. He didn't say no. He didn't say no. So, for us uh, uh, finger phobes, yep, pet them all you want. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's just a joke. Let's not read too much into it. So, uh, Julian Sunnyvale Trailer Park says, Is Elemental Bear a unit and a summon too? Yes, it is. That can be summoned and it can be uh, a bear. <laughs> so good. Uh, next up, uh, Jman5 says, Will Warhammer 3 have extreme unit sizes and will spell damage scale with unit size? So Duck says, No extreme unit size. Which is sort of a pity, because extreme unit size is obviously a unit size added in Three Kingdoms to be uh, even bigger than it, Ultra, I think. Yeah, because Ultra then extreme, uh, which is really cool in 3K. I loved having like these huge, like actually bigger than huge. Huge is actually a setting, but you know what I mean. Um, just the largest possible size. I thought it was really fun. I thought that was really exciting. So it's a shame they haven't added that. I, I really thought they would. I really thought they would. But anyway, regarding damage scaling, we've done a fair bit. Uh, uh, done a fair share of work to improve damage scaling based on unit sizes. Direct damage, healing, single entity weapon and projectile strength, magic missile damage, and now scale with unit size setting. This should make the play experience more consistent across unit size settings. So, yep, that's nice. I like that they've done that. I think that's good. Um, yeah, just good. No more thoughts on that. Uh, so, Triskelly asks, So, Tasting History did a few episodes based on Rome Remastered. If you got a different YouTube chef to make something for Warhammer 3, what fantasy recipe would you like want to see and why? That sounds fun. So, tough question. I'd want something out of Grom's cookbook, even though that's Warhammer 2. Too good an opportunity to turn down. Uh, except maybe not involving the Centigore milk. Maybe not involving that. Yeah. Let's let's just pretend that wasn't a thing. Bloody hilarious. But anyway, uh, right. Next up, Lord Harkon asks, does corn have something to compensate for the lack of magic and ranged firepower? Because of course, corn doesn't use magic. He hates it. That's why him and Zinch are such uh, sort of staunch rivals. Uh, he just hates magic. You've got to use your muscles. You know, magic is cowardly. So anyway. Uh, so, Duck says, extremely strong melee units, plus spell resistance for all corn demons. Corn will, on average, be one of the hardest hitting and elite factions in the game. Which, uh, good. Good, frankly. I, I like the idea of them just being brutally, uh, brutal. And, yeah, you just gotta deal with them with your wits. Wits involving things like magic and such, you know? You've got to outfox them. So, yeah, I hope they are a absolute powerhouse. Um, I hope they're just brutally effective. I really do. I can't wait to play them uh, and play against them. I can't wait to play any of their stuff, honestly. But anyway, um, but yeah, is it? I think they'll they'll balance it fine. So, uh, are bloodthirsters only lords or recruitable units too? Asks uh, Passion. Uh, they're both. Bloodthirsters are lords and recruitable units, which is interesting. That's interesting, isn't it? But I think that's uh, specifically. I think it's the exalted bloodthirsters, the lord pick. And then Bloodthirsters are the unit you can recruit. So, yeah. I think it makes sense. Anyway, um, so they're both. Can, uh, so, uh, can Child Wars uh, Christian asks... Child Wars? Weird clan name. I think that's a clan name. Usually it's a clan name it's in thingy what's it's. But anyway, square brackets. Uh, can we play Vortex in Warhammer 3? Or we need to play Warhammer 2 for it? No, Vortex campaign is Warhammer 2's campaign. So, much like previous campaigns, you know... 
I say previous campaigns. Actually, yeah, previous campaigns, because the mini campaigns as well. You have to load the correct game for it. So, you know, it's a shame, honestly. It would be nice to see sort of updates, but I honestly prefer if they made new stuff rather than having to support, like, just new balance changes and all the rest of it for just more and more factions. Just that kind of, you know, for more and more campaigns, that sort of bloat would mean they'd never get anything done. Um, so, yeah, buy Vortex campaign. But um, I'm sure the new one will be good too. So whatever. Uh, so what <laughs> Willow asks, what is the caffeine of choice amongst the devs? Uh, for Barge, cappuccino with semi-skinned milk, two shots of coffee. Um, or or is that for Barge or is that everybody? Is he answering for everybody? Maybe that's just CA's, um, you know, uh, drink of choice. It certainly wasn't what I went over for the Ever Chosen. But, you know, that's a different breed people they're not devs they're the video team they're different so anyway uh uh taicho brahi or bray taicho bray i don't know celestial wizard uh asks what's the most challenging aspect of balancing the corn army as a whole where just about everything is aggressive is an aggressive melee fighter so duck answers so corn definitely has two dimensions the demonic units for Korn are reasonably fast, very hard hitting, and somewhat squishy on average, while the mortal chaos warriors and skull crushers offer more staying power at the cost of lower mobility. The challenge is figuring out how to mix these two elements together and how to maintain cohesion with these different elements. Korn is also a very elite focused faction, so you'll often uh, need tools to win battles even when outnumbered. That's pretty cool. I do like the idea of there being some elite focused faction. The idea that I think any any faction where maybe you have fewer armies or have to field smaller armies is something I find incredibly interesting because it's usually just 20 stacks versus 20 stacks, right? And that's the pattern. And it's usually as many armies on either side and just smashing together. Um, so if something is very elite focused, I, I'm very keen to see how that'll play out in the campaign map. Um, if I just have one army you know, stomping everything that they come across or, you know, while people are eating the rest of their territory, they can't possibly defend or what. Like, it sounds interesting as a dynamic. So, oh, I mean, that's kind of deep into chaos though, isn't it? Just generally, um, they're, they're very scary things. So, right, next up, Oksu asks, uh, do any of you guys read manga, watch anime? If so, what is your favorite? Uh, Sean uh, watches, uh, uh, watches more anime than he reads manga. And Jojo and Full Metal are two of my favourites. So Full Metal Alchemist is actually my go-to anime to recommend to people because it's like a self-contained thing. It has like a beginning, middle, and end. It's like a finite thing. It's not one of those things that go, like is designed to go on forever. Like most anime, I absolutely adore it. It is amazing. I absolutely love it. Jojo can't understand the appeal. Honestly, if someone in the comments could tell me why I should like Jojo, please do. I just... It, it reeks of every bad cliche from anime. Honestly, it just seems to be hamming it up so much, but I don't think it's satirical. Is it? Is it supposed to be like satire? It's supposed to be a satire of anime? Is that the the fun of it? I don't know. It just I don't get it. It's like literally, it it a character has to tell you every time another character does something. Every time episodes could be three seconds long, and it would be the same amount of stuff happening. Like I don't get it. So anyway, let me anyone any JoJo fans in there, let me know why. Um, visually, it's awesome because like every character is an Adonis but like just yeah in terms of stuff happening oh I just I can't get into it just can't get into it don't see the appeal I know I know sorry Sean um maybe you could answer if you ever see this video thanks Sean so uh true von Karstein is there any particular reason you're answering questions with no relevance to Warhammer 3 in a Warhammer 3 q and A? I I've asked two and seen many others but they're ignored in favor of telling us your favorite coffee like it's not a Warhammer 3 Q&A, it's just a general AMA. It's an ask me anything, not an ask me about Warhammer 3. So, you know, uh, I don't really see the harm in having some fun while answering these. As you can see, many Warhammer 3 questions have also been answered about. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, guys, just generally, calm down. I get the Von Karsteins have a reputation for, you know, being uh, a bit moody, but, you know, like, we get a lot of stuff in. So, also, yeah, never said that it was a Warhammer 3 AMA. Oh well. Actually, it is titled uh, Warhammer 3 Dev Replies, so I guess there is some focus on that, but, you know, it's still an AMA. So, uh, let's see. Kuresh Kongrong. Will... <laughs> nice, I like that. Um, will Kislev be completely landbound, roster-wise, without any flying units? Uh, yep, no flying polar bears. Shame. 
Some flying units would be interesting. But yeah. It's weird because so many of their units have wings. Huh. I genuinely. All the wing glances and everything. All got wings. No flying. <laughs> Just clearly compensating. Just pretending. Uh, so, Rangus says, when can we expect a full trailer for the Silence and Fury DLC? July. So, not long now. Because, uh, yeah, it was announced super early. Like, that's the earliest we've ever had a DLC teased. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Someone may correct me. There might be some obscure DLC somewhere down the line that I'd forgotten about. But, yeah, they never they never tease them that early. Usually, it's like two weeks before release. They go, by the way, in two weeks' time, there's a thing. But, yeah, it's like six weeks, isn't it? Six weeks early, this thing? Them announcing it, which is kind of crazy. You know, pretty mad. So, no wonder it's a teaser rather than the full trailer. So, uh, anyway, Ben Fung asks, will there be green skin nerfs in the next patch? Yes, we took a look at Grom's power level and increased the number of wah points per use of the ability. Other changes too, but these are the two big ones. Um, so, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, green skins have been doing quite well. So, Duck. Um answers question from uh, Viterius. Viterius? Viterius. Maybe. Maybe Viterius. I'm going with Viterius. Your name is Viterius now. I dub thee. So, what are the legendary items, mounts of Katarin, Castelton, and Skalbrand, and what can the items do? So, um... Oh, also, well, there's a lot of, lot of questions here, in fact. Uh, could you give us more specifics on Skalbrand, on how Skalbrand will work as a unit in-game, and also for Castelton? Katarin will have... Uh, okay, so this is the answer. It's quite difficult to tell on this one. So, uh, Castelton... Sorry, Katarin will have Frostfang and the Crystal Cloak. Frostfang allows Katarin to cast a bound Icy Explosion spell, which we've seen in the demo. Uh, we saw in the in the demo battle. Uh, so, very fun. I really like that ability. It's a good one. And Crystal Cloak protects Katarin with a strong ward save whenever she casts a spell, which is awesome. That is really good. I love the idea of being able to defend yourself by being offensive. That's really good. Um, I really like that, just as a mechanic. It, it forces you to be proactive, which uh, is always good in a strategy game. Uh, Castelton has the um, Brazier Mace of Urson, which increases Castelton's weapon strength whenever he goes under 50% health. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. You know what they say about wounded bears. They do more damage. They, they have more weapon strength under 50% health. That's what they say. Uh, Skullbrand has Slaughter and Carnage, which is two axes. Uh, twin axes, see, told you. Uh, increases his weapon strength with each kill on the battlefield. Feed them Skaven Slaves as your own peril. Love that. Because uh, that's the thing. This is something that's really interesting, actually, with um, uh, with, with Skullbrand, actually. Uh, or with Corn generally, is usually with, certainly, like, Foot Lords. You just want to bog them down with crap. Just throw nonsense at them because you know they can't like fly and single out your unit, so you just keep them busy. But you'd be doing that at your peril. You actually want to single them out as quickly as you can, because if you don't get on top of them with something that can deal with them, um, it's going to be so much harder to deal with them later. So while you can delay having to deal with a big threat, it's going to be a bigger threat, which is really cool. Like, isn't that cool? Isn't that a great way to sort of remedy the dynamic of, of just people ignoring foot lords till later, just letting them fall to army losses, you know? Very fun. Very fun indeed. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm excited now. Uh, okay. Skullbrand is a pure powerhouse. He hits like a truck, comes with heavy armor and spell resistance. Is surprisingly fast as well. His only downside is his lack of flying, but he more than makes up for it with his killing power. Oh, uh, whoa. There we go. Kazalzin is very much a support character that has his powers amplified when chucked into melee. Generally, his powers really start kicking in when the going gets rough, making him an inspirational leader for the direst of battles. See, these are very interesting dynamics, um, which I like. I like the idea of a, a character sort of... Um, I don't know, having, having like some sort of condition to their abilities where they have to sort of meet criteria in order to hit their full potential, but in battle. Because again, it's more puzzle solving. And at the end of the day, that's what a strategy game is. It's a puzzle game, but with more complexity, you know? Um, so it gives you like a fun puzzle. Like, okay, I'll have a more powerful guy, but I need to get him wrecked first. <laughs> so I'll send Castelton in there to the front line, try and get him weakened so he can then take on something um, more threatening. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. So anyway, Boris Toadbringer asks, Does Scarbrand's Rampage order affect all units, or are high leadership units or units like heroes, lords, immune to it? 
So at the moment, it's an active ability with a limited duration, but it may change. Development is always subject to change. Uh, uh, Sir Lord Eric of the Sweden slash clips says, if you considered Oxyotl's law fighting chaos, then why did you not save him from Warhammer 3 so that he could lawfully fight a demon of Zinch in a DLC? Uh, there are a few key Elizabeth units still to come, so we wanted to get them into Warhammer 3, and Oxyotl made the most sense to go up against Beastmen for our final pack. So I think it was more the fact that they wanted to make sure they had Beastmen in there, and given the abundance of Lizardmen stuff still remaining, it made sense to put it in the game that has Lustria in it. You know, that's just a hunch. But Sean here seems to corroborate that. So, you know, sometimes you gotta make you got to make choices like that sometimes. Stuff can't be exactly where it needs to be because you can't make the entire game at the same time. Um, you know, at least that's not how they're making this. So sometimes stuff doesn't make total sense, but that's the thing. Once we get the combined map, then great. We can just pick Oxyotl and then go mess up Zinch, you know? So sounds good to me. You know, it's all good. It's a sandbox at the end of the day. So, Marcel S777 says, Does Catherine have any more offensive spells? I found Lord of Ice too passive. Uh, buff slash debuff. Does she uh, access? Does she have access to another magic lore? Um, and yeah, I found her super offensive. Like, when I was playing the demo, she was killing everything. She has huge damage. So, Catherine has three offensive spells. Ice Maiden's Kiss is comparable to Wind Blast, but with an additional freezing effect. Death Frost is like a slow acting short range double spirit leech. Finally, of Heart of Winter, a strong air effect damage spell that slows enemies within its aura of a, uh, area of effect, and the effect gets stronger over time. Additionally, she has her bound Frostfang ability, which is the strong, um, which is a strong explosion spell. Overall, Catherine the Law of Ice should be an excellent damage dealer. Yeah, like brutally damaging. Um, it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how anyone can have assessed it that way. Um, which is bizarre. I mean, there are buffs and debuffs, for sure. But uh, maybe they just watched a bunch of um, the demos they were watching people just content to use all the buffs and debuffs rather than use the big damaging spells. Um, but yeah, no, brutally damaging. Like, those spells are great. Anyway, so. Uh, Gold P. All right. <laughs> Will there be any other magic type for Kislev except Ice in the start of Warhammer 3 since you didn't show any hags? There is also the Lord of Tempest, uh, which is very cool. We did find that out um, during, uh, well, well, my Q&A session with um, with the, de uh, you know, the developers. Um, I like them doing this, actually, because, you know, it was nice uh, when when we played the demo uh, remotely. You know, we had the, the gameplay demo. We were able to chat to the devs afterwards, you know, and do a little, little interview, which is on the channel, by the way, if you check it out. There's a link in the description, or I've forgotten to do that, in which case maybe someone will be kind enough to um, link it in the comments. <laughs> I'll pin it. You know, that'd be good too. But uh, yeah, it was nice to chat to them. But I love they're doing this for the community as well, just so anyone can come in with any old niche question, you know. I know a lot won't be answered. They were literally like, I think there's like a thousand questions around, like asked. It was ridiculous. Like they were rolling in quicker than I could see them. I don't know how the devs meant to keep on top of any of it. But um, anyway, it's good. I like it. So uh, why are bears pulling sleds instead of Oblast Elks from the lore? Uh, so they, uh, that's still asking, by the way. We worked with Games Workshop directly on the designs and functionality of the sleds to respect their law and expectations. So, fair enough. Probably could just be a case of uh, casting additional models for Elks means you're having to design a new cast and CA uh, Games Workshop just want to focus on bear stuff because they can maximize the use of their bear models when it comes to it. Because that's right, there are, there are decisions like that that need to be made, you know. The more they can uh, like limit the amount of casts needing to be, you know, made and designed and everything, the better. So, uh, you know, more bears works for me. Uh, so, Sean uh, answering a question from Stat. Uh, what Warhammer 1 and 2 races do you think could still use an adjustment or brought up to Warhammer 2 3's level? Uh, Sean says the obvious one is Norska. Yeah. Yeah, they're obviously the ones falling behind. Uh, but they're the only Warhammer 1 faction left, I think, to need a, to, to get a rework once Beastman's out. So uh, they've fallen behind during Warhammer 2, and we want to make sure all our factions are great experiences. Uh, I'm kind of glad, actually, that Norsegrave has been left to last, um, and Beastman to an extent. Um, 
you know, the fact they've both been left to sort of tail end because it means that they can more align with uh, their sort of vision for Chaos Factions, which I think makes more sense. So I like that, but it has also meant that Chaos Factions just generally have been really lagging behind um, on detail and, you know, complexity to their campaigns and things. So that is a bit of a pain, but, you know, the whole thing is a work in progress. So what can you do? Um, so, uh, Will Borg says... Uh, are there any changes or improvements made to the difficulty system? Um, so Duck says, from a battle perspective, we reduced the melee bonuses. The AI gets on hard and very hard, as the bonuses were very punishing for melee units. Um, so I, I really, I'm sort of disappointed hearing that, because I think the way they handled difficulty in Three Kingdoms was a lot better than Warhammer. Because in Three Kingdoms, it wasn't leadership bonuses, it was just damaging bonuses. So uh, what tended to happen is, with well, what tends to happen in Warhammer is everyone is functionally unbreakable. They will basically fight to the last, which was just kind of rubbish. Because it meant you were forced to cheese rather than just doing like what would feel like a, like a sound strategy. So like a rear charge, no one would care. Like, yeah, you do more damage, but so it's still beneficial, but you couldn't like break a unit just by rear charging them. So you wouldn't get these cool moments of like, I did something clever and I'm getting instant like reward for doing that maneuver. You know, you don't get that on high difficulties just because everyone is functionally unbreakable because they have such huge leadership bonuses. So it's a shame you didn't mention anything about the leadership bonuses, but yeah, well, it's what it is. So um, anyway, uh, I'll just play on lower difficulties. Like I, I don't play for the challenge, <laughs> I play for the world. So, you know, anyway, Sainara um, asks, what is your favorite breakfast meal? Sean has Weetabix every day. So there we go. Good. <laughs> One less thing to think about. Yeah, but you know, it's good to have, good to have a uh, 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 routine sometimes, you know. Freeze up your mind to be creative elsewhere. So, Mikado asks uh, about Kislev slash Corn, which is the most difficult to create units and which unit? Oh, which, which was it, which was the most difficult unit to create and wait, out of Kislev and Corn, which are the hardest to make and what is the most difficult unit, I think is the idea there. Anyway, we'll see what the answer is. <laughs> so, Barge, the hardest unit to create from a visual perspective was definitely the Elemental Bear. Uh, balancing the amount of snow, flora and magical power whilst making the bear look functional took a lot of collaboration between the artists, animators and VFX team to really make it all come together. That makes sense. It, that looks like... It looks difficult. It looks difficult. Like a guy in armour... All you need is someone who's really good at doing guys in armor. But yeah, Elemental Bear. So many moving parts that are all kind of new. So yeah, interesting. So, uh, Sainara uh, asking, what's your favorite breakfast meal? So yeah, we had that question before, but now Baj is answering. So, two scoops of whey protein, two scoops of oats, oats, one scoop of peanut butter powder, a tablespoon of flaxseed, and a tablespoon of raw ginger, blended with almond milk. That actually sounds rather lovely. Sounds rather nice, sounds very healthy way to start the day and a nice nice tang with the with the ginger there very nice um also i think it's an antioxidant i don't know i've heard good things about ginger and usually when there's good things about food someone says the word antioxidant which means something presumably to know needs a nerf i think needs nerfing so uh at believe in arabian koresh asks is there going to be a difference between spell resistance and magic resistance in warhammer 3 so, magic resistance has been changed into spell resistance in Warhammer 3. We need to change the way magic resistance interacted with magical attacks to make demons play well. So, magical attacks now bypass physical resistance and are no longer resisted by magic resistance. Ah! Spell resistance now only affects spell damage. We change the term to signal that something has changed here. That's actually a big deal. That's actually a big deal. Because I mentioned in... Um, uh... 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 Yeah, in the gameplay demo, I believe it was, uh, I mentioned how the demons are going to be very good against factions like uh, the undead, right? You know, things like uh, the vampire counts with all their, all their ethereal units. The ethereal units will essentially be pointless to bring against any demon faction because all the demon factions have magic damage, you know? Like, they, you can't move for magic damage in those factions because all the demons have magic damage. So, um, yeah, that's actually really great. That's actually awesome if that's the case. Very cool. Huh. That's really going to mix up gameplay a huge amount. That's going to change the better for, like, every faction now. Wow. Okay, I can't wait to see that in action. That sounds really cool. It might be terrible, but it might be great. 
Either way, it's going to shake things up, and I like a shake up. So, anyway, uh, Kaiser Cat asks, sync kills for the bears? Yes, there is a sync kill animation for the bear. Brilliant. Love it. Although, is that killing the bear or the bear killing things? And synced with what? Hmm. It's a tough one. Possibly just for people. You know, it grabs them. Like, like a giant when it grabs infantry, right? That's the easiest sync kill. Just, you know, anything with a, a humanoid skeleton. Just delicious uh, anyway tasty humans right Eomat asks will there be an update to the lighting on Warhammer 1 races and ethereal units in Warhammer 3 going back to the darker look green eyes and others look very bad in Warhammer 2 lighting at sunset especially uh, yeah, they can look a bit uh, uh, sort of grey a bit drab sometimes. Uh, we have improved the engine and lighting system for Warhammer 3. This should be reflected on the Warhammer 1 and 2 assets in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I like the just playing the demo, although I couldn't see it in perfect fidelity when I was playing. Um, you know, from the recordings they sent, even in 1080p, like it, the lighting was really. Uh, it was popping. It was popping. So there is Exalted. Uh, sorry, hang on. Doc Nye asks uh, have, uh, have we more than one kind of Bloodthirster? Yes, there is the Exalted Bloodthirster and just the Bloodthirster, which is the Lord and Unit, respectively. So what I'd said earlier on um, about the, the Bloodthirsters is Bloodthirster, Lord, or Unit, both. There you go. So that's, um, yeah, that's that. Which, again, that those are the two units present in the demo anyway. So we, we've seen them both in action already. So CA uh, Duck answering a question from uh, Con Lao. Who was your favourite Warhammer 3 Lord to design? From the ones we can talk about, Katarin for sure. She was a fun challenge as we wanted to create a human wizard who also felt like a powerhouse of a character, and the art, audio, and animation teams have done a stellar job with her. She does look really awesome. Um, yeah, I can see why. I can see why they're proud of her for sure. So, uh, Master Delta asked, does Katarin, uh, does Katarina, Katarin, have a hybrid spell list, as in both Tempest and Ice, or just Ice? It is just Ice. She is a Law of Ice caster. Um, Avenge21 asks, will Korn have an additional generic lord at launch aside from the Exalted Bloodthirster? Yes, but they can't go into detail about it yet. Ooh, I wonder what it is. Uh, I'm thinking a bloodletter, but hey, it's really the only other kind of demon, isn't it? That isn't like a big dog or something. So, you know, yeah, probably a bloodletter, right? Although I'm sure I'm forgetting something. But uh, we're talking generic lords, by the way. Don't tell me, you know, don't list all the blendary lords. It's fine. So, um, Belord Azul asks, will we see any new corn demons not currently in the Games Workshop model range? No, there will not be. Which, you know, fine. Kind of a pity, but it's the base game. You've got to go with the basics, right? That's why it's called the base X. So, Next up, Very Trash asks, I believe Jarl said, uh, <laughs> this is from the south, clearly. Uh, I believe Jarl said that Scarbrand gets stronger the more kills he gets. Can you give us an answer over how it works? Is it like the blood letters where um, they get like 80 kills and he gets a small buff? Or does he have multiple milestones that make him progressively much more powerful? Um, so, Scarbrand uses scaling ability intensity. So his slaughter and carnage ability becomes progressively stronger and in a linear manner. Don't fully understand what that means. <laughs> it's a linear manner. Does it mean, I mean, obviously it's one trajectory, but is that at certain thresholds it's better? Or is that literally just on a curve? Just, just one kill is one extra percent damage or something. You know, is it like that or is it I don't know it, like staggered I don't know not a clue but fine the more killy the better he killies good so uh, Sushi asks what is the most unique aspect of Kislev uh, how hybrid uh, how hybrid the roster is and how most of your melee units are very dependable in terms of holding a line and fighting till the bitter end um, I do like they have that sort of rigid sort of more traditional um vibe about them but also that flexibility is really nice i think it's such a human thing to have in uh certainly the game that's full of insane monsters um i kind of like that just that uh yeah i don't know it's a good vibe it's a good vibe so uh Moore 
asks, how much physical and magical resistance will blood crushes of corn slash blood letters of corn have? Uh, 20 to 25 percent, but development is subject to change. Yeah, that's that's always going to be the answer when, how about this stat? I don't know, you'll find out. <laughs> that's, we'll see. We'll see when the time comes. That's always going to be the answer. So, can't allow ask what uh, who's your favourite Warhammer 3 Lord to design. Marge coming up with an answer here as well from an art point of view. Katarin. Yeah, she's oh she's she's a babe. So there was a lot of back and forth between our team and Games Workshop on naming the colours, shape, language, and flow of the clothing. Fortunately, they were super happy with what we achieved here, and seeing in the trailer was a delight. Uh Robo 123456 asks, does Kislev have any horses or are they just skinny bears? <laughs> Uh, they have horses and bears, or do they? They do. Yin Yang TW asks, can we expect a full uh, full roster reveals as we received from Warhammer 2, or just the individual unit highlights? I only ask because you've already moved on from Kislev without a full roster reveal. There will be full roster reveals. And I don't think they so much moved on from Kislev as there was a Skulls event and you can't not talk about corn in in a skull in an event called skulls, you know. So I think it was, yeah, they had to change gear for a moment there. But anyway, full Ross reveals sounds good. So uh, AFK asks the snow leopard looked closer to hound units, but you mentioned they are single entities. Will they function more like stegodons, but with more speed and less armor slash health? Uh, Duck saying stegodons are as far away from the snow leopard as a single entity can can be. The snow leopards are fast moving, if squishy, single entities that can use their speed to hunt down vulnerable units like mages and horse archers. Uh, sounds awesome, actually. The fact they can chase down horse archers is great, but, you know, yeah, love it. That's so cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I find that, um, a, again, quite a strange question, just because that was not the impression I got from them at all. I only ever, We've only ever seen them on their own. Um, I don't remember ever seeing more than one of them together, so... But, oh well. Also, they're massive. They're way bigger than hounds. They're more like, um... Uh, what are they called? Uh, brood horrors. You know, the big rats from the from the latest uh, DLC. But anyway. Um, so... Uh... A Yokoba asks, Will the Flesh Hounds of Corn have an anti-magic aura? No, but they have significant spell resistance. Higher than you'd see on the blood letter. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Synchronize asks, could you go into more detail about the wound mechanic for single entities? This is a good mechanic. I like the mechanic. So, Duck answers. So, the idea with wounds is that single entities lose killing power as they get wounded, making damage dealt to them before they are dead more significant. Wounded single entities lose weapon strength and movement speed, making them easier to deal with. So, this is a huge change. Because every unit, you know, every unit of infantry or cavalry, as you damage it, it loses models and they have fewer guys swinging blades around, right? So the more damage you've done to something, the less it's going to be able to achieve before it's killed. Whereas single model entities, it's just one guy and it never made any difference. Like, the, the more damage you did, you sure they could break, but until they broke or were killed, it made no difference whatsoever. Uh, how much health they had so i really like this mechanic i think it's really nice because just just going that is a threat i will put in a bunch of damage with my artillery before it gets close you know that's a great thing whereas again single model entities that were similar to lords um like foot lords if you could just bog them down with something rubbish then you could just do that knowing they're not going to pay for themselves kill everything else and they'll break <laughs> right that was usually the easiest way to deal with them so the idea that actually you can deal with them by being proactive is brilliant i love that i think it's really good so, Monsieur Wolf says, uh, given that Scarbrand can't fly, what ways ensure that he offers more than Exalted Bloodthirsters in combat potential? Which makes sense. The Exalted Bloodthirsters, they're of course going to have working wings, you know? So, uh, makes total sense that he's going to have to um, be better, right? So, uh, Scarbrand is a stronger fighter, and he has a fair share of ways to increase his weapon strength even further. Generally, you don't want uh, to fight a fair fight with Scarbrand. Good. Good, I like that. The idea of him just slaughtering everything he comes near and getting more powerful as he does it is really cool. I really, I am very intrigued um, to see him in action for sure. So, Big Man Axel asks, what's the giant ice bear called? Uh, Grace uh, answers, the elemental bear. It's, it's an elemental bear, that boy, because uh, he's made of the elements and he's a bear. 
Just some guy asks, will the stats of the new units stay the same or will they change close to the release of the game after some tests have been made because some units particularly scale across are quite strong. They're all going to change. We we know this. It, we are months from launch and uh, I will tell you, with my experience, and uh, you can see this just from every preview build of every DLC this game has ever had, the stats never change the same. Right, a day before release, they change. <laughs> like, seriously. They are changing all the time. And of course, the closer to release, the more people have, like, hands-on time with it, right? The more sort of, like, content creators and press and all sorts of people um, have more time with it and find problems and issues and, and, and un, you know, weird unbalanced things and exploits and stuff. You know, the more that stuff comes to light, so the more stuff is likely to change the closer to, you know, the closer you get, honestly. Uh, what you can do, though, right, what you guys can all do is you can tell the purpose of a unit from the offset, right? Looking at its stats, you can see, oh, okay, so this is supposed to be a more tanky unit, or you know, this is supposed to be like a quick um, sort of hit and run kind of thing, or whatever. You can you can tell from their stats what the intent of the unit is very easily. Um, but again, that usually goes with the visuals too, you know? But um, yeah, you can usually tell what a unit is supposed to do, but how good it's going to do that, I mean, the stats don't really tell you on that anyway. Let's be honest, like seeing the stat line, no no one can read the stats to that extent. Because it's a bunch of other stuff like their attack intervals and things that aren't even there. Like, it's, it's a sort of non-thing. I think people put way too much stock in stats. It doesn't really, you know, yes, changing it will change how it, it's it goes but until you actually see it in action and play with it you're never going to know how it's going to perform really so you know ignore the stats guys ignore the stats do yourselves a favor so uh oh also and someone will say oh but that unit is way better than a comparable unit for a different roster in warhammer 2 everything in warhammer 2 is going to change all right all those stats will be different they'll be rebalanced by the time we get the joint map anyway okay ignore warhammer 2 different game all those stats are going to be tweaked because stuff is different now you know so, anyway, uh, I know, tangent aside. So, uh, Boris Todbringer, uh, again, great name. For Skullbrand's Rampage Aura, uh, what does weak willed mean? Does it mean it only affects units with low leadership, or are Lord Slash Heroes immune to the Rampage Aura? Um, so, it means that if they are under 70% health, that then they may enter a Rampage. So, um, weak willed means damaged. So, if you've been stabbed, you're weak willed. Magic in it. So, uh, right, uh, Viterius asks, Can you tell us more about the Blood Throne? As in tabletop, it was a mere mount for the Herald of Corn. So, I would like to know two, uh, two things about it. What is his special ability? And is it a normal unit? And who can use it as a mount? As a follow up to this, where is the Herald? I have seen the Blood Reaper as hero. Does that mean the Herald will be a Lord option for Corn? Uh, the Blood Throne comes with a totem of Endless Bloodletting Order, increasing the melee attack of units around the Blood Throne, plus its Gore Feast ability allows it to heal while in melee, which is horrific and awesome. Again, it's it's corn stuff forcing you to be aggressive with it, and I think that's really good. So, uh, big fan of that. Big fan of that. Uh, so, the other questions will get answers with the corn roster reveal. Awesome. So, Foz82 asks, Development of Warhammer 3 has been much longer than Warhammer 2. How will this be reflected in the final release? Meteor. It'll be Meteor. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Although, specifically, Meteor. Meat magic? Huh? Huh? I'm trying to, try to segue towards an Ogre Kingdom's hint, but I don't think that's what that is. <laughs> It'll just be a meteor game. More to it, you know. But uh, hey, who knows? So, uh, Big Man Axel uh, asking, what's the giant ice bear called? Uh, Tip Top when summoned, and Slush when it's defeated. <laughs> and uh, the serious answer is the elemental bear, of course. But uh, yeah, nice one, Burge. So, uh, next up, uh, uh, Gruski, I think that's pronounced, but I don't know. Either way, somebody uh, asks, Will you be changing the unit sizes and stats for the Blood Crushers and Skull Crushers to fit their monstrous cavalry role? Being very strong elites and rare needs to have uh, needs to have a price uh, at uh, and be low in numbers. I'm I'm assuming uh, Blood Crushers and Skull Crushers have the entity count that works with their monstrous cavalry role, matching units like Demigrip Knights. Yeah, they they were monstrous cavalry. Like you could immediately 
like see their role. They they had smaller units than than cavalry cavalry. Um, but I think some confusion here could just be because the demo was on max unit size. Um, not extreme because that doesn't exist sadly, but they were all on ultra sizes for the gameplay demo. So um, you know, monstrous cavalry probably looked like there were way more than a lot of people would have been playing. Um, so you know, most people playing demographic knights are smaller units. And um, it's sort of easier to tell with a unit like that rather than just like a block of infantry. That just sort of looks like a block, right? But when it's something like Demigriff Knights, you know, something similar to that, you're going to notice if there's more of them. And I think that could be where the confusion lies. But uh, yeah, they fit perfectly for me. You know, it's like, yeah, they were smaller units than cavalry and clearly monstrous. So that was fine. Um, anyway, uh, Gree asks... Uh, Sorry, my throat's getting a bit. I did make a cup of tea. It's going to be ice cold now. Ah, rubbish. Still fine. It's a bit cold, but... It's tea, in it? It's lovely. So, uh, hey -o, Creative Assembly. Thank you very much for your fantastic work on Total War Warhammer 3 so far. Here are my five questions. I feel like I should be accompanying music, but I can't be bothered to edit that in. So, um, it's just whatever music has been playing. But, you know, it feels very game showy. <laughs> So, uh, number one, what is Scarbrand's weapon strength? Over 600, subject change, and can go far higher thanks to abilities like Frenzy, Slaughter, and Carnage. So, yeah, just heavy hitter like Kolek. Um, so, fine. Uh, what would you say is the biggest weakness in Korn's roster? The lack of magic is definitely a big disadvantage. You lose out on a fair share of adaptability due to it, but luckily Korn units have the killing power to compensate. And yeah, just magic is so overpowered. Like, it is so good. Any, any any army that you have if you put a wizard in it it is going to be better no matter what unit you drop even if you drop a star dragon and put a wizard in it that wizard can do more than a star dragon you know wizards are just brilliant they are so good cannot be cannot be stated um enough but yeah corn not having that they're gonna have to swing their axes bloody hard and uh i think they're gonna <laughs> so sounds great to me so from the way castalton was described it seems you want him to be in the thick of melee uh the more damage he deals the more his units get buffed is that so uh so optimal castalton play will revolve into getting him into the thick of melee with zargard or war bear riders on his sides uh, buffing them with his abilities. If the enemy tries to take Castelton out, it fuels his passives further, and Castelton is also excellent at cheating death. He has a passive health regen that kicks in when he comes close to death. So that sounds to be similar to um, Orion's uh, Cloak of Isha, uh, which sounds cool. I like that. And probably with a big chunky ward save on top of it. It sounds like he's got the Cloak of Isha to me. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I think he did, they did mention a ward save earlier. Was that for Castalton? I think it was. I can't remember. Maybe. Possibly. But either way, the regen's great. So, uh, next up, question four. How strong is Kislevite cavalry compared to cavalry units in game one and two? Like the Reich's Guard and the Dragon Princes. So, Winged Lancers are on par with Empire Knights. They are lighter and more offensive. And Griffin Legion are on par with the Reich's Guard and lighter and more offensive again. Uh, Warbear Riders are probably more comparable to a unit like Minotaurs with great weapons. Uh, excuse me, rather than monstrous cavalry due to their entity size and number. Uh, they also seem like fairly slow in my experience. I can't remember the speed stat. Uh, I'm just going sort of holistically here because you know me, I find stats are, you know, kind of meaningless. Um, speed is obviously one that is very easy to trace, but you know what I mean. So anyway, um, they felt they felt a lot more like that. So, uh, how do the Streltsy compare, range-wise, to Thunderers and Handgunners? Uh, on par with them, roughly. Which uh, actually does make them sound like they're going to be pretty damn good against uh, Dwarfs, actually. It sounds like they'll be very good there. Uh, although, low armor and low shields uh, means they're probably going to be very, very weak to just, like, cheap range of fire or something. But uh, potentially they could be very, very useful. But you've got like winged lancers to chase the rangers down. But then they're going to be very weak to artillery. So, oh god, I just can't wait, guys. I can't wait to get my hands on all this stuff. I'm already, I'm already theory crafting. Um, so, on par with them roughly. Okay. So, uh, oh my word, we're, we're at the bottom. <gasps> we're at the bottom. Which means I actually have set up my uh, recording wrong because I need to scroll up with the <laughs> capture so we could get the bottom of the screen because I had it to the top. I wanted to make the writing big so you could see it, but, you know, it's ruined everything. 
so it's fine. So how do you make sure that each unit in the corn roster shines and there are no overlaps in their roles as it's mostly a melee base, uh, based roster? That's definitely a challenge. Luckily, the demonic units and the mortal units have very different roles, with demons being hyper-offensive and the mortals being hyper-offensive with staying power. Additionally, we've wanted to focus more on the demons than the mortals with each of the rosters. Hadn't I, hadn't I said this? Hadn't I said this earlier? So the demonic part of the roster is intended to be the dominant note, with the mortals offering interesting support options, filling out some of the roles that we felt needed to be filled for our gameplay vision. So this ties into previous thing of uh, there are no like new demons right all the demons are part of models ranges for uh, games workshop and if you guys know anything about demons the fact they've been split up into four races here it was only one army book for all the demons one army book so splitting one army book into four means that every single demon faction is a quarter of the size of another fact of like a normal uh other faction like the empire or something right so um it's gonna be it's gonna be a smaller roster just from the demons so you're gonna want to fill it out with something else so that's what they're doing clearly which is fine you know they could fill it out with a huge amount of stuff because uh, that's the thing demons of chaos isn't just demons of chaos you've got the warriors of chaos stuff uh with all their you know specific uh different flavors for the four different gods as well as uh beastmen stuff as well you've got the beasts of chaos the warriors of chaos and the demons of chaos right it's there's a lot of stuff sort of uh outside of the of the generic and outside of demons but it's a demon-centric game, you know? Conquer your demons. So, on, on the base release, that's totally what they're going for, and it's nice to see it confirmed here. Uh, even though, to me, it just seemed, you know, plain as day. But I know some people have been saying, you know, we did it Scarbrand and not, like, um, that they're getting us the Legendary Lord and not, uh, uh, like, uh, Valkyrie or something. But she's a, she's a warrior of Chaos Lord. She's not a demon of Chaos Lord, and they're focusing on demons. There you go, guys. Focusing on demons. Told you. Told you. We know now. We know. So, uh, right, I need to scroll up this page. Oh no, I just know I'm gonna, I'm gonna ruin it. Uh, oh no, we're doing good. Oh, well, bit to the side. Okay, we're fine. We're fine, guys, we're fine. We're fine. Ooh. Okay, uh, I'm gonna fill it all in. <gasps> I am. Excellent. Oh, stop, stop that. Good, there we go. I am a genius. So, will Kislev play defensively with his roster considering they are the first line of defense in the realms of man? Kislev playstyle is mostly defensive, at least when fighting against factions that lack their firepower. Kislev excels when it gets uh, to hold its ground and shoot at an enemy trying to close the distance, while being peppered by frostbite arrows and ice sheets slowing the advance down. Wing glances can shatter weakened enemy units with their charges, and once the lines have met, the hybrid units can hold long enough for the hammer of the cavalry and the war beast to hit the enemy. Against the, uh, against the likes of Empire, High Elves or Dwarfs, Kislev will have to pivot towards a more melee focused approach, centering around the cavalry and the war sleds. Interesting. Interesting. I think a lot of that comes with the fact that um, all their cavalry is going to be very weak to, um, uh, uh, you know, cavalry going to be weak to artillery. So you're not going to want to just have like a prolonged engagement against all those artillery focused factions. And uh, uh, like all of your infantry is just going to be weak to to miss our fire because they're all quite low armoured you know being sort of hybrid units their, their downside is their low armour so you don't want to be in a prolonged engagement with them when they're just like cheap archers and things that can you know pick you off so uh, yeah very cool very cool to see that there's there's that flexibility though um, and also it does it, it's it's interesting because this feels to me like because uh, they've always been very good at like a last stand kind of thing um, but also the whole uh, the whole Kislev thing their sort of tactic day to day uh when you know combating their enemies is is very much sort of um uh, divide and conquer and harassment and just sort of letting the land do the job um but of course total war is all about big battles happening uh rather than just sort of weakening things on the march so you've got to take a very different approach when designing the army around that around actual fighting rather than the law which is like oh yeah they'll use you know horse archers to slowly whittle them down sort of lead them around um you know, around in circles for ages, so they just freeze to death and get killed bits by bit, and once they're looking really haggard, Wig Lancers go and finish the job and break them. So, you know, there's still that sort of harassment, but it's it's from a from one line, right? Rather than ever ever sort of shifting uh, battle lines. Which is interesting. It's interesting to hear um, sort of this different take. I mean it's a similar take. Similar 
it's using the same technology. You know what I mean? But anyway, it's, it's uh, whatever. Ignore me. So, uh, how does playing Kislev feel different from similar looking factions we've already f uh, we're already familiar with, like the Empire and the High Elves? Uh, Kislev's focus on hybrid ranged units really sets them apart from Empire and High Elves. Kislev smashes its missile units. Uh, Kislev smashes its missile units. Are also, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what he was trying to say there, but um, anyway, Kislev has has it. He might have been on his phone, and his phone decided to be a, a dummy. Uh, Kislev has his missile units. No, and, and anyway, his missile units can form a battle line. Let's say that. Uh, additionally, the Laws of Ice and Tempest are uniquely crafted to work with the Kislevite playstyle, and the lack of other Laws of Magic really shape what Kislev can do in battle. So, yeah. Cool. I like it. You know, unique magic uh, offers different gameplay. Uh options and challenges which i think is really cool uh i'm just very excited now and now i'm sad that we can't play it yet but soon tm um i mean still could be months and months off but we'll see this year supposedly you know we're halfway through the year already so it can't be that much longer um but yeah brilliant uh so that was the q a guys took forever obviously but i wanted to be thorough and uh, i did warn you that you should have made a cup of tea so you know hopefully you drank yours anyway that'll do it i suppose uh so guys if you enjoyed this please do comment like and subscribe and uh be sure to stick around for more warhammer 2 and 3 and 4 there's not a fourth coming as far as i'm aware but if if there ever is i'll be covering it so stay tuned and uh yeah take care guys i'll see you the next one laters <laughs>